All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming down. Uh, my name is Justin, and I am going to be talking about uh, the CAN bus, uh, specifically CAN bus in uh, automotive applications. Uh, so a little bit about me. My name is uh, obviously Justin. I go by J-Dog Herman on Twitter. Uh, you can also find me on Keybase. I'm an active board member of the Neo Northeast Ohio Information Security Forum, which is a group that's been going on for about 12 years, I think, maybe more, uh, in the Cleveland region. And uh, if you guys are ever in the area and you're looking to uh, sit in one of our meetings, uh, just reach out to me. Uh, I'm a penetration tester in the finance industry. I'm into electronics and uh, ham radio and also a big board game geek. Um, so if you ever want to talk to me late at night, uh, you talk to me about those things and I'll talk forever. Uh, so you have been warned. Uh, I am not an expert in this. I don't claim to be. I don't pretend to be. Um, I'm not... I'm not uh, responsible for any of the troubles or anything you do to your uh, cars or um, anyone else's cars or the rental of cars or anything else. I am not, I'm not, uh, don't follow what I'm saying. Uh, the opinions are my own and uh, not of my employer. Um, so uh, last year uh, I drove a, a pretty uh, non-remarkable car. Um, uh, it's a 1996. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys remember the Ford Aspire. It's a very small hatchback. Uh, looks like a shoe and drives down the road. It has nothing fun in it to be able to really uh, get advanced information from. Uh, you've got basic ODB2, hard, hardly any other information you can really draw from that. So last year, I got myself a newer car, uh, this time a little bit older, but... Um, it meant that I could have a new toy and I could go ahead and take things apart and figure out how far I can go with this uh, car hacking thing um, that was available. So uh, when I began, I was looking for um, obviously the vector to get into the system. And, and that's, of course, the ODP2 port, right? Everybody uses those. You, you, in Ohio, we plug in, you get emissions testing that to say if your check engine light's on, you don't pass, um, and so on and so forth. I didn't know much about the connector itself. So what I found in my research, uh, was that the SAE defined it, the connector as a J1692. It has 16 pins. Um, it's sometimes called the data link connector. And uh, by specifications, it's supposed to be no more than two feet from the steering wheel and not supposed to be uh, require any tools to access. Now, my car specifically leverages uh, some other pins, but the standard uh, that's Standardized uh, connections are to use um, the 1850 with SAE uh, for both pin and pin, pin two and pin ten, uh, ground on four and five, both for chassis and signal, along with uh, ISO 15765-4 CAN bus high on six, pin 14 has the ISO seven. 15765-4 for the low, and then of course uh, the, both the K line and L line and a 12 volt power supply. I didn't know what any of this meant. And so I started trying to look in to find more information. And what I found was that um, the SAJ1850, which is on pin two and pin 10, those are really designed for the Fords. Um, they used pulse width modulation to control it, while uh, GMs leveraged a variable pulse width. Uh, the ISO 9141-2 is for Chrysler, European, and Asian cars. And the uh, ISO 14230 um, for K-Line and L-Line uh, were, were for other, other types of vehicles that weren't included there. One cool point that I found about this is that not all of these connectors are the same. There's actually a second specification that's out there which permits for 24-volt applications. And in that uh, case, there's actually a um, divider in the middle, which uh, doesn't allow the uh, insertion of the mail plug. So OBD2 was required in by CARB, which is the California Air Resources Board, uh, back in 1991. And that's really was uh, pushed by um, for emissions, emissions testing. Uh, they were having, obviously, bad emission issues in 1970s, 1980s. And California is always trying to lead uh, that that. Uh, and champion that. And so in 1991, they required some sort of onboard diagnostics. In the U.S., all cars built after 1996 had to have ODB2, and uh, it was primarily used for diagnostic support information regarding, again, just emissions. And 
uh, at this point, I got a little confused trying to understand what ODB2 was versus CAN. I've heard both of these together. And what I found was that the ODB2 is basically just sits on top of the CAN bus. It's a, it's a language, as you could maybe say, um, that would be able to communicate in certain standardized parameters. CAN, which was the uh, uh, 15765, uh, dash four was required after 2008 uh, for all all cars. So, if you're thinking about doing this, getting into hacking on cars or having some fun and figuring out what's out there and doing some fuzzing, um, having a newer car obviously is going to offer a lot more features. Um, so, what happened to ODB1? Well, ODB1 didn't actually exist. That was uh, manufacturer manufacturer in specific, uh, manufacturer specific to whatever their whims were. Um, I've had a vehicle that actually required me to put a jumper, a piece of wire over uh, a port that was, that looked like an ODB2 connector, as they say. Um, and instead the check engine light would flash in certain sequences and that would tell you your error code that was available. Uh, again, usually those were again for just, uh, emissions testing. So the CAN bus was actually designed in, by Bosch in the 1980s, and in 1991, they released both a CAN 2.0A and a CAN 2.0B. Uh, this is, again, this, this was adopted in 1993 um, by the ISO 11898, uh, the ISO standard. Now, the difference between A and B is actually the um, address length. In A, you get 11 bits of data for address, and in B, you get 29 bits of addressing. Uh, when you think about like the OSI model, uh, the CAN bus sits basically in the in the data link and physical layer, um, while ODB2 would be more transport and uh, network. So there's three different three different uh, standards that were established out. There's 11898-2 uh, for high speed. Um, this was a binary one for which is considered dominant. Apart so binary zero, which is considered dominant, it's uh, when it's driven low. Um, for low signal and then driven high, where high signal binary one was recessive and it commonly floated at, uh, at around 2.5 volts. Um, and then when it would return back, it would, uh, they both return to the uh, uh, 2.5. In ISO 11898-3, uh, there was a low speed signaling, and I'll show you a little more about that signal and how that one works. And then uh, ISO 15765-4 uh, is the one where really going to be talking about, and that is uh, a form of the 11898-2. Uh, this shit's complicated. Um, <laughs> so can, can bus high speed, uh, again, this is that high speed I was talking about. Um, there's a differential between both uh, the high voltage and low voltage, and both signals, the high and low, are driven um, to their respective uh, voltage potentials, uh, it signifies a zero, and then when to return, they signify a one. And uh, that's how this uh, high-speed ISO standard was established. This is, again, the one we're, we're using. Uh, high-speed network was all on a, on a standardized bus system. Um, they had a stub length of no more, and the standard is no more than 30 centimeters. Uh, linear bus is terminated at both ends with 120 ohm resistors, and... Um, Everything needed to be basically in a line and connected up. They did come out with, again, the low speed option, um, which allowed the nodes, individual nodes to terminate uh, and actually bring up the, their resistance, both ground and uh, their five volts. But the total resistance on that was around 100 ohms, and with no more than each node having at least five ohms of resistance. The speed for the high speed is 500k, and uh, I think it said the total length would be about 40 meters. With the low speed, you're talking about 30 to 125k bits. So in low speed, um, you are driving individualized signals which are closer to five and, and closer to zero, and inversing them. Now that time for that collapse of the uh, signal is the reason why we have to slow down the transmit um, data transfer that, that can actually occur. Low speed can 
work in a star or, um, or mesh topology. Um, it's far more flexible, but again, you've got that low speed. Uh, and when you are talking about certain systems in your car, um, high speed is going to be necessary for like your engine control and transmission and uh, brakes and so on and so forth. While the low speed systems can be the seat heaters and the instrument cluster and radio, um, more creature comforts in the cabin. So there's four types of frames that exist on the CAN base um, network. Uh, there are data for sending, obviously, data. The remote, which is to request data. Errors and overloads. And errors and overloads are basically sisters of one another. Um, it, it, when you have an error, the system, if it detects one during a frame session, it will go ahead and transmit uh, six dominants, which is our zeros, followed by eight recessive ones, and then followed by the interframe spacing of at least three dominants. If the system detects um, it needs more time between for processing, it will create an overload, which is the exact same signal as the error, but not in between a data frame or remote frame. Um, if if an, each node, as they're working on the system, will actually keep a, ca a tally of how many errors that they're occurring, and if they see less than 128. Um, they will go ahead and send an active error frame. If either if their transmit or receive receives more than 250, um, they'll put a passive frame, which means they actually don't transmit. Um, they just sit for the allotted time. And if uh, the transmit is greater than 255, the device just stops participating altogether in the, the network until it's reset for most types of nodes. So the data frame starts out with, uh, obviously, start a frame. It marks the beginning of the data and the remote signals. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see this, how well it is, but that's the portion of just a little white. The green is our arbitration field, and uh, this includes the message ID and the remote transmission request bit, which that determines whether or not this frame is a remote request or a standard data frame. Identif and the, also the identifier uh, is in that arbitration field. That can be, the, again, the 11 bits or it can um, go to uh, 29. Um, the next is a control uh, field, which is res just reserved, and uh, user to determine, the, sorry, the, there's a reserved bit, and then there is a control field, and it's used to determine the data size and the message ID length. So, oops. So in a frame, if you want to send, if you want to send additional data beyond the payload that's allotted in its data field, um, you would send a one in that control field um, versus you sending a, a zero, which is a single frame. Each subsequent frame would get a two instead of a one, and uh, flow control frames, which help determine uh, the speed and uh, accuracy, those are three, and then four, and five, four through 15 are uh, reserved. Uh, data field, this is actually where the data goes, and um, really only applies to uh, data frames and not remote frames. Uh, CRC field is a checksum that's available to help to determine that the message was um, not garbled when it was received. And then you'll have an acknowledgement uh, along with a delimiter and then an end of frame. Um, all date CAN bus 2.8 um, will have this exact same thing. Now, if you want to get to 2.0b, uh, you, what you're going to do is you're going to change out the arbitration field and make that a one instead of a zero, and then that will actually extend the total amount of uh, data that you can total send. But you're going to then just after that arbitration, just after that remote, the arbitration field, you'll have another uh, uh, section which will be another 19 bytes, um, allow, you to, allow you to have additional um, identification. So when two nodes on the network identify a, a collision or um, they are, as they're processing through, they need to arbitrate who's going to actually transmit. Oh, well. Um, they will uh, listen for their own transmission. And uh, the, then after they have waited uh, the allotment of time, they will go ahead and uh, process based on their message ID. Lower message IDs uh, receive a higher uh, priority. Um, ODB2 is uh, lives on the CAN bus, and it's a part of the unified diagnostic service. Uh, that is closed source, and Ford has been generating some OpenXC, um, which is another type of 
replacement for the Unified Diagnostic Service, but I'm, I don't have enough information about that. Um, OBD2 messages uh, are, again, filled out this, uh, the you can see it on the request, 7F, uh, sorry, 7DF0201. The um, 7DF is uh, the identifier, uh, along with the bytes and length, which is 02, and the mode that you're requesting. Um, there's a series of modes that are in OBD2 messages. Um, when DTCs uh, come up, or diagnostic trouble codes, uh, they are appended with a P or B or a C or a U. Uh, that stands for powertrain, body, chassis, or user. The second digit determines whether or not it's government issued or a manufactured issue. And then the third digit will determine the system that it's actually involved in with subsequent being the actual error message. So if you're getting started, and I know this is going to run a little bit long, is um, I began with using uh, an Elm uh, 329 and Torque. Um, it's basically an uh, Android app. Um, it's available for free. And that's the Elm's 239. 327 are pretty good for just checking ODB2 messages. But I wanted to get into something a little bit more, and I wanted to actually send CAN messages. Uh, so I actually picked up a scan tool, an ODB2 link, MX Plus. Didn't really offer me enough control, and I found that the buffers were overflowing, so I went to a, a Machina, uh, M2, Open Loop, and Comma AI Pandas um, in order to enumerate uh, the CAN network. Uh, I, I'm aware that there's CAN TAC, CAN DO, and CAN ABLE. I've not used any sort of ex any experience with those. The software that you're going to use for that is, um, at least I used, was Savvy CAN and uh, Putty with or Hyper Terminal. But uh, if you're in a Linux environment, Socket CAN is a great option, along with CAN Utils. And uh, if you have Wireshark on a Linux machine, you can actually uh, address it, CAN messages that way. So when you're collecting data, you're going to, go to reduce the signal to noise. Um, so what that meant for me was I turned the car off uh, and captured a baseline signal when the system was still initialized. So just after turning the car off, waiting, um, captured that particular baseline, and then went and captured a, a known signal. So five presses of a key or um, pushing the pedal down and back up with a known sequence. Um, from there, I take both data sets, and I will go ahead and eliminate the baseline from the sample, and basically rinse and repeat. Do this multiple times and iterative, uh, and then I've got a, something to really work with as far as analyzing. So we'll go, I would then count the incidence of messages uh, from the filtered sample data, and then I look for timing between the messages. So um, you know, once if I push the pedal five times and I only see one um, action, then Obviously, the, the count is not correct. If I see one at the beginning and one and three at the end, and I pushed four times, then it's probably an issue because I should have been coming up in even patterns. And uh, I'll eliminate matching signals between. So if I'm pushing a, a button on the steering wheel for up, um, down is probably going to be fairly close in um, coming from the same module and uh, might be similar data. So I can use those. Uh, when you're testing, um, obviously there could be dragons there. Uh, that's concerned because you're, you're now transmitting onto the bus, and uh, you don't necessarily know what every message that you're sending out. But hopefully, we're littling that down using some frequency analysis is a strong way to be able to um, get yourself in a better position. Um, I did have my car lock up where I needed to power cycle it, but a simple power cycle fixed that. Uh, division testing is another method for determining what um, which messages are what and trying to reverse engineer those. So you take the full sample, you uh, send, you retransmit the first half, and you see if your um, the impact on the system is viewed or not. Uh, if it was, then you divide that first sample up. And of course, three is fuzzing. It's not very product, uh, effective um, because there's a lot of data points that can happen in there, and it becomes very difficult. Um, once you've got the message, or you've got an idea of the message, and you want to know more about what each data bit stands for, there's an open DBC, um, which is basically a, a lookup table between how to convert the data sections in the message to human readable information. So, um, you know, how many RPMs and such. Um, some suggestions uh, on if you're looking to try to do um, 
to do this is obviously look for pattern recognitions, and I recommend uh, Google search. Searching for similar issue, similar makes and models and brands is a strong way that you'll find more information. Um, some ideas if you're looking to get into yourself would be uh, you know preconditioning your car or um, autopilot with comma AI home automation. So when your car gets home because it has a GPS, most likely that you can uh, go ahead and receive that. Um, make other automations inside your home turn on or whatnot. And AV controls, if you're like mine, uh, I have my phone set up, so when I connect to the audio jack instead of Bluetooth, I can still use the thumb pads, uh, directional keys on the wheel in order to control the phone. Additional resources, uh, obviously the Car Hacking Village is a great opportunity. Uh, building your own bench lab is very uh, informative. Um, Car Hacker's Handbook, excellent book, available by No Starch Press, and uh, there are found out this today is actually there is um, an application called IC Sim along with CAN Utilities and you can actually create a virtualized bus in order to uh, attempt to learn a little bit more and experience yourself. And with that, um, I'll finish. Thank you.